So welcome to this ethnography and political theory workshop organized by the Department of Political Economy at King's College London and the Engaged Theory Community. We have had a wonderful turnout, but a little confusion as our collaboration resulted in the problem of multiple messages being circulated, some of which had the link, others didn't. Um, so I'm very grateful to you for pursuing and, uh, and finding your, your way here. Just welcome. Um, if a colleague uh, is unsuccessful and contacts you about the webinar, uh, please assure them that it will be is being recorded and will be posted at the engagetheory.net website, which I've put in my name line so that you're um, you're able to write that down and and, uh, and follow up there. But do understand um, if in the Q and A period you are elevated to a panelist, um, you will be recorded in that context. So let me begin importantly by thanking Humera Iktikar, sorry buddy, um, for organizing this panel. Uh, after our launch event last April, um, and these are also view viewable on that website, we invited Humera to um, pursue a question that she had asked um, during the panel and which really required its own panel to, to engage with. And so um, she contacted the colleagues who are before you today and we are really looking forward to the results. We created the EngagedTheory.net website and these events to support the work of scholars like you around the world and across approaches to political theory who are working to make normative political theory more engaged, more grounding in the meaning making of those engaged in political struggle. Through a range of empirical methodologies, surveys, interviews, participant observation, participatory action research and ethnography, Theorists across questions are pushing our field to be engaged in the ways that many indigenous thinkers and feminists and social critics, particularly from marginalized groups, have always done, to quote Leanne by Kasomase Simpson. Now, um, and panelists have been reflecting on why to do this work and how to do this work well for a long time and share their insights from a range of studies. While the title of the panel opens with ethnography, I think you will hear from them about a range of qualitative methods. So that we can keep the conversation rolling, I'm gonna introduce our panelists to you now and, uh, and we'll proceed in the order in which I introduce them. So first we have Banu Bargu. She is a professor in the History of Consciousness program at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She is the author of the 2014 book, Starve and Immolate, The Politics of Human Weapons, and editor of collections, including Turkey's Necropolitical Laboratory, Democracy, Violence, and Resistance. Paul is a critical theorist based at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He combines political theory and qualitative methods in his research and his books include the fight for time, migrant day laborers, and the politics of precarity, and breaks in the chain what immigrant workers can teach America about democracy. Sagnet Dutta is associate professor in the law school at OP Jindal Global University in Delhi. Their research is at the intersection of political theory, political philosophy, political anthropology, critical legal social studies, and critical international relations. They've published numerous articles on gender and the law in sociology and gender studies journals. Rebecca Mellons is a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University and a faculty member at Royal Roads University in Victoria, BC. She uses engaged and collaborative methods of research to study climate change decolonization and democracy's fraught relationship with diversity. Her most recent publication is a chapter in the 2022 edited volume, Democratic Multiplicity, Perceiving, Enacting and Integrating Democratic Diversity. And last but not least, our co-host, Mira Iktadar, is professor of politics at King's College London. She writes on post-colonial theory, comparative theory and Islamic thought. She's the author of Secularizing, Secularizing Islamicists, Jamati -e Islami, and Jamati Udoa in Pakistan, and co editor of Tolerance, Secularization, and Democratic Politics in South Asia. Her next book under contract is Just Beyond Rights Tribals, Refugees, and the Idea of Ha. Thanks to each of you for participating. 
I remind everyone that this is being recorded and will be posted on the Engage Theory Donut website. You can enter your questions in the Q&A, which will enable me to group them, or the chat if you can't find the Q&A. If you are willing to or would like to be elevated to ask your question yourself, please indicate that. I will promote you to ask your questions and note that this means that you will be recorded. If you want to receive notice of the recording being made available and or want to learn about other events that we host, please sign up at the engagetheory.net uh, connect on that, on that website. Each panelist will take 10 to 12 minutes to address the framing of the panel um, that Humair offered in the advertisement that was circulated to you. I will keep time as well as know that the Q&A session uh, does provide a great opportunity and public service for all of us um, in terms of stimulating discussions for new ideas, as well as helping us understand how all of these panelists are contributing to this ongoing dialogue together. Thank you again to Humair for organizing the event. Thanks to you each for participating. Um, really, this is what we were hoping for and we're really delighted that we're all engaged in this way. Um, so without further ado, we are going to begin with a finding. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you, Brooke, for introducing us, for facilitating, and thanks so much, Humeira, for inviting me to join this, what I assume is a very global conversation, so it's um, quite nice. Um, okay, let me begin on an autobiographical note. Um, when I was in grad school and political theorists were asked, what is their method? There was one predominant and self-evident answer to what seemed to be clearly a trick question. What is your method? My method is reading uh, and reading some more, reading critically. Um, the obviousness and perhaps nerdy humor of this answer, however, occluded how the boundaries of the subdiscipline of political theory were policed and how this policing was transmitted from generation to generation in every grad classroom through obvious self-evident curricula thinkers to read, approaches to learn, and in turn deploy as the norm of what theory was and what it ought to be. Sure, we were exposed to the normative variant of theorization, to the Cambridge School, to Marxism, to Straussians, to post-structuralism, but other than situating oneself in one school rather than another, everything that pertained to the real world, to actual political actors, to conflicts, were relegated either to themes in contemporary political theory, and even then, maybe, um, or to other subfields. So of course, war was the domain of IR, authoritarianism of comparative politics, democracy of American politics. Believe it or not, this is not a joke. At best, we could dabble in democratic theory, debate and find justifications for its deliberative versus radical versions, but always at a distance, at a remove from political actors and their contentions. Needless to say, political theory was also hopelessly Eurocentric, where both the first order thinkers of the canon and the location of the political not only originated in the West, but somehow belonged to it and remained tethered to its hegemony. Non-Western thinkers could be explored within religious studies, non-Western actors within anthropology or area studies. Today, this division and ordering, this epistemological partitioning, strike me as the production of ideology in its purest form, the production of political theory as the consciousness or self-representation of the West or the global North, the expression of the hegemony of a Western world order, and an academic division of labor in which the more abstract dare I say, higher and more universal work of conceptuality could only or predominantly come out of the Western academia as a locus of knowledge production and enunciation. It turns out that it was also the way to render political theory increasingly marginal to the discipline, self-referential, perhaps irrelevant, and the purview of a handful of scholars. I don't think I'm alone in these critical thoughts toward the mainstream of the discipline as there had been, has been much more interest from within political theory circles, broadly conceived, in diversifying methods, questioning the boundary policing, 
and the functions of political theory in relation to the broader public it seeks to serve and educate. Today, we see a number of thinkers pushing for empirically grounded theory, grounded normative theory, ethnographic sensibility in political theory, as well as others advocating decoloniality, indigeneity, comparative political thought, feminist methods, not only as a way of pushing back against what is political theory, but also how and why it can be done. While I think plurality should not only take hold in methods, but also in the realm of the choice of theoretical objects, research sites, and thinkers, Today, I would like to focus my reflections only on ethnography and its relevance, especially for the critical strands of theorizing within political theory that are known as critical and radical theory. Let me begin by defining both terms. I understand ethnography to be a dedicated effort of research in the field that involves immersive study, participant observation, and in-depth conversation whether in the form of formal or informal interviews or more ad hoc conversations is a different issue. These together supply the lived experience of politics. Ethnography then is a form of boundary crossing. And like every boundary crossing, it has its temptations and rewards, but it also has its dangers. I understand critical theory as distinct from positivism to be guided normatively oriented toward the elimination of human suffering. This is Horkheimer. Critical theory is a kind of border crossing because it reaches beyond the empirical to what ought not to be in order to critique the world. Even in the way that I've defined these endeavors, one can see kindred spirit in boundary crossing, but I will argue for a more organic connection. Let me briefly talk about the contributions of the ethnographic and then turn to why critical theory is necessary too. Ethnography, ethnography is crucial, I will argue, for three forms of boundary crossing. The boundary between theory and practice, the boundary between philosophy uh, or theory and politics, and the boundary between the universal and the vernacular. The boundary between theory and practice. Ethnography generates theoretical questions out of political practices being in the field, immersed in the lived experience of politics is not in order to find an application of a pre-established theory or selected concepts, just to see them in operation in a different context. Such an approach, I think, is a temptation of ethnographic work that should be avoided. Really interesting work comes out of a real encounter in which the practices that the theorist comes into contact with become the source of new questions new concepts, new arguments. The point is to approach theory in its lived forms, discourses, and practices, and not to illustrate or ex explicate, but to generate new theoretical insights. The boundary between philosophy and politics. Here I have in mind how ethnography animates political theories, political entanglement. What makes political theory political? Is it just the object that it reflects on, such as the concept of sovereignty, democracy, et cetera? Or is there something also in the method or procedure of reflection and the relation of that procedure to its object that must be political? And what is the political here at all? I understand the political as situated by conflict all the way down. Here, the point for me is less to take a political position in a way that tries to speak for often for a disadvantaged group, become a conduit for their voice. In fact, I think this is another fallacy of, ethnograph of ethnographic work. Then to engage struggles, speaking from the point of view of struggles rather than speaking for them. So I don't have in mind any kind of ethnography, but the ethnography especially of political struggles, symbols, practices, and discourses of those struggles. And the, the third binary, a boundary, the one between the universal and the vernacular. Ethnography is a way, in my opinion, to think from the global south, not in order to write off the political manifestations as a vernacular of the Western universal or to explain it by exoticizing the difference, and this is another temptation, 
but rather to find how it constitutes a kind of political universal from the margin. And this dimension is crucial for questioning the primacy and often exclusionary nature of Eurocentric theoretical traditions and value systems, not only from without, but also from within, by reanimating the radical and critical traditions within the West, as well as beyond it. All this brings me to the importance of ethnography for critical theory in particular. If it was Kant who first established an equivalence between modernity and the practice of critique in his essay, What is Enlightenment? It was undoubtedly Foucault who repeated this question, delineating it as an ethos, as a way of re relating to the present, not just in terms of the Kantian project of reflecting on the limits of knowledge of what is knowable, but as a political project about the limits of government and self-government. Foucault positions critique as the twin of being governed such that it emerges wherever there is government. So critique, as he famously defines it, is the art of voluntary insubordination reflected in tractability. So it's a contemplated refusal. If critique is not to become self-referential, it must engage the suffering in the world. It must speak from struggles. It must capture the plurality of human experience beyond what is hegemonic. It has to speak back to the canon with the political practices of those in conflict. It is to make a democratic and living canon, a global canon, with the discourses of those who lack the epistemological standing to be considered political thinkers, to learn from their experiments, innovations, and knowledges. This is why I think ethnography is a way, an important way, though of course not the only way, of injecting life into the project of critique today to write a more egalitarian history of the present. At the same time, however, and this is the last point, critical theory, or what Foucault calls the critical attitude, is also crucial for the practice of ethnography. This is because with critical theory, can ethnographers refuse the temptations of application of ready-made concepts, the temptation of pure partisanship, and the temptation of exoticization and relativization? Back to Horkheimer, if critique is a reaching for what ought not to be while examining and explicating what is, the what is that ethnography allows us to learn from in situ work can appear as absolute Transhistorical and unchangeable if it isn't interrogated in light of what ought not. I'll end here. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to Humera and to Brooke for organizing the event, and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, so I'd like to offer uh, some comments on both why political and critical theorists should undertake ethnographic research and how to do this based on my research in critical theory and with US Latino migrant workers organizations. So to take up the first issue, the why issue, um, I find part of an initial answer in an unlikely source, Theodore W. Adorno, about whom I wrote my first book. Now Adorno and his Frankfurt School colleagues uh, are, are certainly not known as ethnographers, but they did formulate what I think remains a powerful premise for critical theory. And this is the notion that critical thought is not adequate to itself, that to gain distance on the reigning ideologies and structures of social domination, the mind requires some kind of impetus or motivational energy from outside itself. Adorno looked to aesthetic experience to provide such transformative contact with the historically shaped sensory world. Following my early projects, I have focused on exploring how the dynamics of lived experience in politicized communities of working people can catalyze theory's critical sensibility. Now, another reason why critical theorists especially should strongly consider taking up ethnography has to do with the rather unadornian aspiration to fortify popular movements of oppressed and excluded persons. As Lois McNay writes in her new book, The Gender of Critical Theory, quote, an interpretive account of experience, direct subjective experience, ought to be a central element of a critical theory that seeks to directly address those oppressed groups who are the subjects of inquiry and aims thereby to make a practical contribution to their struggles for freedom. Ethnography enables access to such direct subjective experience and thus 
I think it helps make good on theory's political commitments. McVay also suggests a fruitful way for us to address the issue of how to engage with people about whose experiences one wants to write, which she argues should be in the spirit of dialogue, collaboration, and intellectual egalitarianism. She writes, dialogism implies that knowledge validation is a cooperative endeavor where the theoretical and experiential perspectives work towards mutual improvement and expansion of thought. In other words, as ethnographically inclined theorists, we ought to be doing research with people in the field, not on them. I'd like to suggest four concrete ways to nourish dialogism in ethnographically invested political and critical theory. So first, co-creating field research instruments and protocols with the people about whom you're writing. Second, letting the theoretical ideas and problems that define your project emerge through your interactions in the field, even as you engage in academic series of discourse. Third, participating in the community in ways that are not directly instrumental to your research. And fourth, adapting your own theoretical approach to the intellectual culture of the people with whom you're conducting the project. Now, the first two points go together, and let me explain this. So if we let ourselves be guided by the principle of dialogism, then we need to devise research practices that are thoroughly collaborative and instantiate the value of reciprocity. Um, one way that I've consistently done this has been by co-designing my field research procedures and tools together with the migrant worker organizations that have given me access to field work opportunities. And this can mean making sacrifices. You have to give up a degree of control over the main concepts and problematics in your own project. That can feel very weird, especially for academics like theorists who mostly are used to spinning out arguments with complex analytical architectures pretty much on our own. As an example, when I started research for uh, uh, with Latino day laborers for my recent book, The Fight for Time, I wanted the interviews to include questions about their personal migration histories, because this had been a key dimension of my previous field work with immigrant meatpacking workers. But the day labor centers where I was doing field work knew that these undocumented workers were too recently arrived and too fearful to talk about such sensitive topics with someone they didn't really know, even a volunteer like me who was often around the center. So the organizers and I refocused the questions more narrowly on workers' experiences of day labor jobs and building politicized communities through the worker centers. To put the point more positively, frankly, I find doing field work very exciting because your theoretical interests gradually dawn on you or suddenly lock into focus in ways you can't anticipate as you participate in local activities. When I began my field work with day laborers, I didn't set out to write a book about precarity and the politics of time. Rather, I realized that I wanted to write about those concepts the more I observed daily life at the center and the more I talked to the workers. I was reading Moisha Postone's Time, Labor, and Social Domination, Kathy Weeks's The Problem with Work, and Lauren Berlant's Cruel Optimism during that same period. My theory of precarity then emerged from the interchanges between these thinkers' accounts of broad scale social power dynamics and what day laborers told me about their everyday lives, searching for jobs, doing dangerous work, and dealing with abusive employers. Now, having said that, it's important not to assume that field work always has to foster a seamless, academically productive interaction between theoretical reflection and observations and conversations in concrete contexts. Um, to the contrary, I, I think it's vital to contribute to the communities about the, of the people about whom you want to write in ways that are not instrumentally related to your research goals, or at least not directly. So I volunteered regularly at the worker centers in Seattle and Portland while doing my research, teaching English and taking employer calls. I also helped out with odd needs like acting the employer's part in a theater-based organizing activity, or handing out name tags and leaflets at an urgent community meeting the day after Trump was elected. For me, such activities relate to one of ethnography's hallmark features, and that's the ongoing need to reflect critically about one's own position vis-a-vis -vis the people whose experiences and perspectives you are studying. Gaining some level of trust will always be an issue for me with Latino migrant workers because I don't come from their communities. I'm a white American man with elite university credentials and the advantages of language and citizenship. 
There are important things people will not share with me. In certain ways, they will talk to me because they need to protect themselves in situations where they have plenty to fear from strangers. They'll also speak to me strategically, aware that they might gain some benefit from connecting with a person of relative social privilege. Ethnographic interactions are always shaped by power. That power is relational, and we need to engage rather than ignore its dynamics. I volunteer when I do field research, partly to signal that I support the community's self-advocacy as important in its own right, and also to show that I'm aware how easily my projects could end up augmenting my own social advantages while doing very little for the community's members. At the same time, getting to know people and daily rhythms at the worker centers as a volunteer, well, that's increased my ability to understand what people said and did better than I otherwise would have done. And I think it also encouraged workers to talk somewhat more expansively about their experiences than they would have if I just tried showing up to do the interviews and participant observation and left. Now then, a fourth way to foster dialogism in the research process is to let your method be shaped by the community's own intellectual culture. A turning point in my own explorations of how to combine theory and ethnography arrived when I learned about the vital role of popular education in the day labor movement. At the heart of Paolo Freire's theory is the thesis that oppressed persons can and should act as full-fledged subjects in analyzing and transforming their conditions of subordination in solidarity with others who may not share their specific oppressions, but still are negatively affected by broad dynamics of domination. Now, Freire conceives of dialogue as the key means through which social critique from society's edges emerges. And by dialogue, he means radically egalitarian group-based communicative practices through which oppressed people interrogate social power dynamics and develop and implement strategies to change them through collective action. For Freire, academic field research can facilitate such dialogues by identifying what he calls generative themes in the distinctive language people use to describe their struggles in particularly poetic, um, concrete, emotionally intense, and sensorily evocative ways. The themes can then be used as material for popular educational dialogue sessions in the community to refine the themes and then realize their political potential. And we tried this with some of the day laborers themes about job health and safety problems. But it's also possible to fold into the methods of critical theory, the processes of identifying and revising generative themes. In what I call critical popular research, one explores resonances between generative themes from the field and critical social theory, thus mingling theoretical innovation from beyond the academy with academic efforts to conceptualize systems of capitalist and racial domination. In my book, The Fight for Time, this meant reading De Labor's commentaries jointly with the theorist I mentioned, and thereby crafting a conception of how precaritized time pervades society, even as it assumes exceptionally harsh forms for certain groups. And this interpretive process sends circles back to popular education and extends its reach. So for instance, at one of the day labor centers, we experimented with a workshop for a class and racially diverse group of volunteers based on the research. Now imagine, what if popular education style group dialogues constituted the form and substance of field research from the very start, rather than being limited to exploratory efforts in the project's final stages? So right now, colleagues and I are trying to accomplish the former um, through our research in Southern California's Inland Empire. Our core effort is to facilitate regional organizations' efforts to provide a series of popular education workshops. And that's mainly where the field research is taking place. That's where we are identifying popular themes and looking for their sparks with critical theory. The warehouse industry dominates this region east of Los Angeles, making it the central hub for commodity distribution logistics on the West Coast. Warehouse developers are voraciously buying up land and displacing families who had fashioned distinctive ranchero culture, owning a bit of land, a small house, a few farm animals, in neighborhoods that spatially embody the persistence of people's Mexican roots. The warehouses are also bringing enormous fleets of trucks that poison the air with their exhaust fumes, driving up respiratory illness rates. As a specialist in labor and Marxist theory, my first impulse was to have our project focus on working conditions in the warehouses. But the starting point for our field work is collaborating with local organizations to do popular education. 
and labor organizing among area warehouse, warehouse workers has been quite weak. Environmental justice and housing displacement, however, have galvanized local protest. So we are partnering with an EJ group that is at the forefront of organizing on these issues. My fellow researchers and I instigated the workshop series by connecting seasoned popular educators from the day labor movement with this EJ organization and funding this all through our Mellon grant. But the organizations are the ones who are creating the curriculum and running the activities, which we then join as participants and co-analysts. Um, to conclude, um, as to our contribution to political theory, well, I'd say that that's under construction. I know that we'll write about the spatial and environmental elements of Latino working class social reproduction. I know that we'll thereby try to theorize what racial capitalism means in a world economy dominated by logistics and in the neo-colonial experiences of US Latinos. But we need to see what generative themes the popular education sessions produce before we can settle on conceptual terms for rethinking racial capitalism in the shadow of Amazon. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Uh, second. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for these great contributions so far. So my uh, presentation will speak a little bit more on uh, substantively on my research in India, but I'll also try to talk about the broader questions that the panel is attempting to address. So to start off, I uh, would like to kind of discuss a little bit about why these alternative ways of political theory matter in non-Western contexts. So uh, non-textual ways of doing political theory are important because in the project of rethinking what political theory does, we might end up, it's not a project that should merely entail including more voices from other parts of the world or non-Western thinkers, but to my mind, decolonizing political theory and rethinking political theory. Also, it entails uh, kind of thinking about how we might think of political concepts and uh, theory itself. So and ethnography might help us kind of uh, non-textual ways of doing political theory might help us reframe some of the key debates in political theory and how we approach these debates as well as expand the domain of theorizing beyond normative justification and historical analysis of the development of texts and institutions. And in my uh, project, my aim is to, again, use ethnography as a useful way of studying the relationship between liberalism, minority rights, and gender, because my uh, larger project is very squarely interested in looking at what these conceptual categories such as liberalism and democracy look like in parts of the world where they did not originate. So, um, and my epistemological aims here are again to generate, generate knowledge about the everyday life of liberalism and minority rights and to move beyond abstract theoretical debates on liberal justification of uh, minority rights that have predominated the conversation on multiculturalism. So again, before I launch into kind of the nuts and bolts of the kind of research that I do, I do want to spell out that my, the questions that I'm asking are not about how we might justify minority rights in liberal terms, but I'm more interested in the range of ethical, spatial, material and bodily ways in which minority rights politics are constituted. And this might add and expand and augment our conceptual understanding of the relationship uh, between liberalism and uh, minority rights. And to that extent, my work looks at the engagement of working class Muslim women activists with uh, Muslim law in India and I, Kind of conducted ethnography with a social movement that engages the domain of uh, minority rights and Muslim law in India. And I studied kind of alternative dispute resolution forums and also the pedagogies of some of these activities through kind of close immersion in, in these communities in Bombay um, 
so that's what my work is on and that that's my fieldwork side and in this kind of short presentation i'd like to kind of talk about how the idea of the public private divide is something that i saw reconceptualized in the spaces where i was conducting my fieldwork in the alternative dispute resolution forums which are popularly referred to as uh, Sharia Adalat or Ortho Ki Sharia Adalat because these are alternative dispute resolution forums that are predominantly run by uh, women who are trained as Qazis and uh, I mean there's a lot of legality involved here which I can go into at the time of the discussion but just for because of the paucity of time I'll focus more on what I observed and the theoretical implications of that. So to start with like to kind of lay out the conceptual contours of how the public-private divide has been understood in relation to religion is that the, the secular liberal state, it is um, the edifice of the secular liberal state hinges on creating a public-private divide and religion is increasingly considered to be kind of through the processes of secularization and modernization to be a domain of the private. And the secular state we have, as we have learned uh, from the more critical work on secularism of uh, Talal Asad and Sabah Mahmood, that the secular state is, um, it creates this division between the public and the private, but it is also incredibly invested in redefining this division between the public and the private and also reorganizing the domain of the private. And recent ethnographic work um, on India and, and kind of these kind of alternative dispute resolution forums in India have shown us, um, especially the ethnography of Catherine, anthropologists like Catherine Lemons and Jeff Redding have shown us how the gendered ideologies of the state also filter through to the private divide where um, the gendered ideologies of the state essentially, which are premised on an idea of the heterosexual family and on uh, kind of gendered kinship roles uh, for men and women, these are ideas that filter through to the private space, uh, e even when the state ostensibly is not kind of interfering in the private domain. So that's the kind of a uh, conceptual contour of the problem that I try to explore using my fieldwork. And what I am trying to show in my um, in one of the chapters in my book is how this private space, this so-called private space, is a space that is constituted through the spatial practices of working class uh, Muslim women and how these alternative uh, dispute resolution forums, they challenge and reconstitute ideas of kinship and uh, minority rights. So through an ethnographic exploration of these everyday black practices of Muslim law and minority rights, I show how uh, the dominant gendered ideologies of the state are being reconstituted in these spaces because the alternative dispute resolution forums themselves are spaces that are at the cusp of the public and the private in some ways I show because these are spaces that are different than the formal courts and uh, the parliament and public institutions because they are not state institutions in that sense, but these are also spaces within the community that are different than the home. So these are spaces where women can, they, they, there are intimate spaces where women can talk about the violations that they face in the home and then they can articulate alternative uh, notions of justice. So it is a space of intimacy and comfort which enables women to talk about the violations that they, space, that they face in the home. And because it is kind of associated with this kind of a Muslim feminist initiative, and therefore it is a space of debate, discussion, and consultation, which is also open to some uh, public, uh, to some public um, figures such as lawyers and researchers and journalists. So the private sphere spills over into the public in these spaces, which is what I try to show in my um, ethnography. And now I'll quickly read out a seg segment of kind of the ethnography where I show what is going on in these spaces. And um, so in the interactions between the Qazi and the, uh, and the women who approach the Sharia Adalat, 
and the Adalat is the Alternative Dispute Resolution Forum slash Informal Court. Uh, the Adalat emerges as a place where the family can be publicized and women experience this space as a forum, as a space for comfort, where they can talk openly about the violence and the hurt caused to them in the institution of the family. In my enmeshment with the lives of litigants and activists, it became clear that women expected, and this is something that I found very intriguing, that women expected everyone present in that space of the informal court to empathize with them when they spoke about the violence that they experienced at home. And at the start of the fieldwork, when I spoke to two of the activists about whether my presence in the court would um, cause any harm to the women, and they are given my clear identity as an outsider in terms of class, gender, and uh, religion, uh, they allayed my concerns and said that the idea of the space as divided into private and public was a Western construct, which most of these women did not share. Uh, one of the activists suggested that I could help litigants with reading documents that were written in English and get involved in other ways with the work, with the everyday work of the court, such as data entry of cases using a computer. During my fieldwork, I got more and more involved with the multiple lives of the cases and the litigants as I accompanied many of them to the police station, to the courts of other Qazis and the legal aid cell of Women's Commission, uh, of the State Women's Commission. In the space of the court, the women and men, they usually addressed the Qazi who was presiding over uh, during the hearing, but at the same time, there was an expectation that the audience who had gathered would pay attention to the nitigrities and the details of the cause, so, uh, of the, of the uh, case. And the conversation often would extend to everyone else present in that case, even though the case was referred to the uh, Qazi initially. And the case, the space was frequented by lawyers, journalists, civil society activists, and researchers. And civil society activists would also carry out training sessions with members of the movement in an adjacent room in the vicinity of the Sharia court. Female litigants who visited the Sharia Adalat would be unperturbed by the presence of outsiders who would often share stories of grief and suffering with outsiders. Now, women who approached the forum, they often spoke about divorce as a result of the routine domestic violence that they faced. And in most instances, they demanded post-divorce maintenance, but this was not based on any presumption. Again, uh, the post-divorce maintenance that they demanded was not based on any presumption of wifely duty or benevolence of the husband, but rather as a legal remedy that is available to them in conditions of precarity. The female Qazis themselves argued that the demand for maintenance was a reward for domestic labor put in by women. And on one occasion, again, the, this, the, there was a particular ayat of the Quran that came up quite often, which talks about how this, uh, the, this is the Surah 65.6, which has been translated as, as follows in her interactions with the litigants, Sheikh would often translate the surah as follows, that even if your wife nurses your children, you are supposed to pay her. If she is not able to nurse her, employ someone else. This is a summish, of course, a summary of the surah, which is far more detailed and complicated. But what she would say is that the maintenance that was owed to woman was something that was owed to her because of her domestic labor and not because of the gendered position that she occupied in the family and it was it was not charity so again um, and then there were instances of domestic violence where um, a woman came in and said that she did not want to approach the police and where uh, the female Qazi who was presiding over the court actually actively encouraged her to approach the police in instances of uh, domestic violence. So in these interactions, again, what I noticed was this kind of a uh, contrast to the gendered ways in which the state law um, it conceptualizes marriage and divorce and maintenance and the paternalist ways in which the state courts uh, often constitute the, uh, the, the idea of the family. So and I'll quickly wrap up by kind of talking about how this is important for the larger project also of decolonizing uh, political theory and decolonizing the idea of liberalism, because this helps us understand that, that 
you know, there is a lot that we can understand about the functioning of liberal institutions by observing these everyday practices of the ways in which people occupy space and also what kind of negotiations uh, are being enacted in these spaces uh, are also political and conceptual. So these are not just everyday kind of practices that are happening ad hoc, but there are ideas of what is just and unjust as also uh, particular ways of inhabiting institutions that is a part of this domain of negotiating uh, minority rights and the law. So I'll stop here and I look forward very much to uh, the thoughts of the other panelists. Super, uh, thank you very much. Onward, together. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to listen to my fellow presenters. Um, I am joining from the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, also today known as the city of Victoria on the west coast of Canada. And uh, beyond acknowledging my presence as an uninvited guest on these beautiful lands, um, I want to acknowledge that my ways of thinking and theorizing have been profoundly shaped by how local Indigenous nations live in reciprocal relation with the earth, and I want to express my gratitude for that gift. The topic of today's webinar is close to my heart. I believe that deep engagement with diverse actors and communities not only generates more robust, relevant, and rigorous theory, but that it also actively disrupts and holds relationally accountable a knowledge production system that has historically erased certain voices and ways of knowing in what Nishnavik scholar Leanne Simpson calls cognitive imperialism. So I cover this topic through the lens of epistemic justice and accountability. As an engaged eco-social theorist and a scholar practitioner, I work in various capacities to advance this type of research. For nearly 20 years, I have worked as a scholar practitioner and engaged theorists with communities and agencies in Canada and internationally. I teach collaborative leadership, decolonizing research and participatory engagement methodologies in my capacity as faculty at Royal Roads University in the master's leadership and global leadership programs. And I'm currently conducting postdoctoral engaged theory work, building on my recently completed doctoral research with youth climate justice activists, which I'll speak about today. I'm also one of the founders and an associate of the Cedar Trees Institute, a research network that fosters interdisciplinary dialogue and engaged theory on democracy and eco-social justice. So today I'm gonna to briefly speak to how I became engaged in this type of research, a few of the issues I think are at stake here, I'll offer the example of my work with youth climate justice activists, and then some closing reflections on the future trajectories that I would love to see with this movement moving forward. In my 20s as a young political philosophy graduate student, I became acutely aware of a disconnect between the discussions I was having within academia and the social institutions and systems about which we were speaking. I felt I was talking to fewer and fewer people the further I went down my academic track as the vernaculars became more and more specialized. And this just seemed to me to be the wrong direction to be going, given that the topics I was interested in were democratic theory and justice. And something I blame on being an experiential learner, I was acutely aware also that I didn't feel like I had a very strong grasp or grounded understanding of the institutions I was critiquing. So I made the decision to leave academia one year into my PhD to go work for a while outside academia. I went on to work with a range of human rights and social change organizations from small nonprofits to UN agencies. And I realized two things very quickly. One, these organizations were generating theory and this theory was directly relevant to the kinds of theorizing I'd been engaging in. Some of the theory was implicit in the assumptions and assertions that their work was making, but much of it was actually explicit through clearly articulated theories of change based on scoping studies and research, et cetera. And two, just like the disconnect between academia and the institutions I had noticed, there was another point of critical disconnect between these organizations and the very populations for whom they were trying to seek change. For example, I witnessed organizations spending millions of dollars in programming without meaningfully or systematically engaging the communities for whom these programs were designed. So this was the first time that I caught a glimpse of a larger issue at play here, a systems issue. And I saw that these points of disconnect were related, both generated by what I refer to as an individualist knowledge production system that underpins not only our academic institutions, but all dominant social institutions. Analyzing that through the lens of indigenous and social justice theory from the global south, 
This knowledge production system operates through hierarchies that define what constitutes knowledge and who holds it. So my work quickly crystallized around working with these communities to support their perspectives and experiences to be taken into account by these organizations' theories, decision-making, and spending. This work soon also entailed teaching organizations and their leadership how to engage in such participatory and ethnographic research with these communities. Through this work, I came to appreciate firsthand just how true the old adage is that communities have the best solutions to the challenges they face, with a big caveat. That is, if they have the time, space, logistical, and other supports they need to meaningfully reflect, interact, and connect their ideas with those of different actors in the system. These insights and experiences informed my re-entry into the world of cultural, political, and social theory when I came back to finally complete my PhD. I had the explicit goal of connecting my theorizing with my applied engaged approach in my doctoral research, which I will share with you in a PowerPoint now. So I work on a set of intertwining theoretical issues that these days it's not hard to find groups actively interested in and engaging in. In my doctoral research, I asked what ecocentric social change theory could learn from youth climate justice activists when engaged as theorists in their own right. Although wildly diverse as a movement, many youth climate activists have nuanced and complex understandings of the structural dimensions and systemic nature of the ecosocial challenges they face. For the most part, they stand outside of institutions, a stance that bolsters their radicalism, their outside the box ideas, and their urgent contestation of these systems. However, this stance is also a point of significant vulnerability for them insofar as they have limited influence and lived experience of these institutions, making intergenerational collaboration especially important to their epistemic inclusion, let alone leadership. These criteria fit with my decolonizing approach which requires that there be reciprocal, mutual benefit and shared interest in the collaboration. All of the above in mind, I chose to engage with participants in the North American Consultation on the Rights of Children and Youth to a Healthy Environment, renamed Phoenix Consultation by the youth participants. And this was one of a series of regional consultations that were occurring to inform the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. It was an interinstitutional intergenerational trilingual collaboration with a diversity of participants from across Mexico, Canada, and the US. While COVID extended the already lengthy engagement, the one year delay actually offered some very serendipitous gifts to what was possible to do prior to the four day event, creating the ideal conditions for what I call an ecosystem approach to collaborative engaged theorizing. It gave more time for in-depth engagement of young people in the lead up to the consultation, including the opportunity to offer youth participatory action research training so they can conduct their own research. An intergenerational advisory committee was struck that was made up of youth and elders from each of the three countries, and they oversaw all aspects of the design of the event, including the methods of engagement that were used. I facilitated the formation and regular meeting of an academic committee, which included interested youth, and representatives from 15 different institutions from across the region in the lead up to the event. Online technology enabled a more diverse population to attend beyond the usual suspects with a focus on those who are often marginalized from such processes due to socioeconomic factors or disability. It also enabled a wider mix of participatory engagement methods during the consultation. Here's a full list of all the institutional actors that end up getting engaged in this process, in addition to the 200 individual delegates, most of whom were young people. So you can see I didn't control or manage this project, but rather I was a part of this project and my research was a part of this broader ecosystem of actors. We co-designed and used a range of interactive and participatory small and large group methods, as well as some methods that supported anonymity. And I wanted to highlight this today. Qualitative research still often privileges the individual as the unit of knowledge and its focus on methods such as individual interviews. Based on the claim that knowledge is always relationally generated, however, Maori methodologist Linda Tuhiwai Smith calls for there to be more use of methods that engage the social unit. So in much of my work, I try to ensure interactive methods where groups have opportunities for individual input, but also the chance to participate in collective sense-making. 
While this is not always appropriate for gathering individual stories, depending on the nature of the topic, such interactive sessions can be optimal for engaging participants in the data analysis process. Similar, I also often integrate arts-based methods and approaches as a means to decenter the reliance on text as the privileged way of knowing. There were three distinct outputs that were generated from this consultation. The Phoenix Manifesto, and this detailed participants' demands. This was drafted and translated by the youth participants based on their real-time coding of conference data. And that, that data included all of the participants' voices. They brought this back to the full group on the final day of the event to get input and feedback from the wider group. And they offered avenues for individuals to provide anonymous feedback, consent, and dissent after the event. There was also a report which youth delegates formally presented to the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment based on a systematic coding process by a youth research team, which I oversaw following the event. And I engaged dialogically with youth climate justice activists perspective and analysis in my dissertation to explore, challenge and transform my own theorizing. Rather than expecting or hoping that I would agree with their perspectives or that they would all agree with one another, which they didn't, I approached points of divergence, both between participants or between them and my thinking as a co-generative space that deepens theoretical exploration. What was critical for me here was to clarify where my perspectives diverged, how their perspectives were transforming my own thinking, and to ensure that I honored their opinions and intended meanings. I do the latter in a variety of ways, um, including using their direct quotes where I can, engaging with their own analysis to ensure that I encounter the data within their frameworks of understanding. As James Tully argues, it's not possible to ethically engage another unless you're encountering their ideas on their own terms. So whilst I've conducted different forms of engaged theory over time, I think of this example as a form of what I call ecosystem theorizing. I use the term ecosystem to reference a relational knowledge production system that I think is enacted in such projects within which each actor is recognized as holding distinct knowledge that they contribute to the overall system, and that knowledge is understood as being collaboratively, not individually, co-generated. For me, I think this also helps clarify that the engaged theorists can play different roles in these ecosystems. And so it doesn't mean that they have to develop skills and engagement methodologies or methods, because these can be quite different skill sets and interests, so long as there are others in the ecosystem who are doing this. Instead, it points the way towards a type of collaborative theorizing. This approach for me also speaks to Micmac Elder Albert Marshall's concept of two or many-eyed seeing, which casts polarities and diversity as sources of strength that co-generate richer ideas that are better able to address the types of complex, urgent problems political theorists are taking up today. Moving forward, I'd love to see there be more intentional spaces created through conferences, dialogues, journals, publications for such a diverse ecosystem of actors to come together and engage dialogically. I'd love to see this work be transdisciplinary, such that it can benefit from traditions such as indigenous theory that have long conducted such theorizing, whilst building capacities of political theorists who are interested in engaging in this type of work. Last, for me, engaged theorizing Engaged theorizing doesn't just offer a distinct modality of being relationally accountable. It stands as a call to all political theorists to clarify and name their grounds. This speaks to James Tully's point that universalizing theories can have a tendency to conceal their social, political, and parochial roots. So this movement, as I'm prone to call it, it is also a call to reparochialize and clarify the grounds of all political theory. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. And Mara will conclude us and then we'll move to the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, when, um, you know, part of the intention for this workshop was also to support graduate students and early career scholars seeking to engage with ethnography and more immersive ways of um, carrying out uh, research for and political theory. So with this in mind, I've chosen to speak about a question that, uh, you know, all of us have struggled with in different ways. And we've just heard uh, excellent reasons for why ethnography and immersive political, immersive research is, is useful and important for political theory. 
Banu and Paul have um, spoken explicitly about the value of ethnography for critical theory. Sagnik has highlighted uh, the use of ethnography in understanding the lineaments of liberal ideas in, in non-Western contexts. And Rebecca has helped us understand the value of uh, immersive methodologies in theorizing with communities. But I think that, you know, one of the challenges, and this is actually going back to a question that another uh, uh, um, scholar uh, and friend who also carried out ethnography for, um, uh, for political theory work asked at a workshop a few years ago, so this is Matthew Longo and Matt asked, you know, how can we write so that we incorporate the full richness of ethnographic material in writing for political theory audiences? The challenge is often that ethnography raises such rich material for us to work with um, that we end up making very hard choices. We end up curtailing a lot of that material. And, and I think that it is useful perhaps now that we've, uh, we've discussed you know, why, why ethnography for political theory or why immersive uh, uh, research for political theory to also start uh, perhaps debating and discussing a little bit more about um, you know, how do we do this. And as I said, everybody in the panel has done this uh, and, and we've heard very eloquently about um, how they've done this. Um, in my own work, I've done this uh, in slightly different ways to think about uh, conceptual relationships, uh, for instance, the relationship between secularism and secularization, where, we, where I have made this counterintuitive argument that opponents of secularism might, even if inadvertently, facilitate secularization, the social process. So if you think about secularism as an ideology and secularization as a social process, we have very little theorizing and, and very little understanding of how the two are connected. Um, and I've also used ethnographic research to explore the global reach of neoliberal ideas, particularly in relationship with, uh, with particular traditions of thought, in my case, the Islamic tradition. And I've argued uh, in a short piece uh, that part of the reason why political theory came so late to questions of colonialism is a methodological problem. The reliance on text had meant that uh, political theorists were isolated to some extent, or mainstream, or most Euro-American academic political theorists were isolated from uh, interlocutors who would push back on the kinds of questions they were asking and the kinds of answers that they were providing because texts do not really talk back in, in the way that human, uh, human interlocutors might do. But as I said, you know, we can all recognize that writing ethnography for a political theory audience is an ongoing struggle. It entails making some hard choices given the richness of ideas and information that ethno ethnographic research allows. So let me give you a brief example. Uh, from 2013, I've been carrying out research with refugees and migrants from the tribal areas of Pakistan. And these are people who were as affected by the war in Afghanistan from 2001 on, onwards, because that war spilled out very quickly into their areas in Pakistan. And of course, for many years, the Pakistani state also did not uh, recognize this war on them and then participated in it. Uh, they were subject to US drone attacks, uh, Pakistani military operations, as well as the rise of various militant groups once, the, uh, once Afghanistan was attacked by NATO forces. Um, now, sitting together in a large group, one family recounted their experiences of aerial bombing. These were carried out by both the US and by uh, the Pakistani armies. The grandmother who was narrating this um, was you know, a very active, quite dominant uh, woman. And she spoke of the day this happened, the one day that they had a very, uh, they, uh, they had um, bombing in their area. So all the other men and women in the joint family system in the big house that they li lived in together had gone out to the fields to work. And she was alone uh, at home with the various grandchildren. Suddenly she heard the sound of planes and they all knew what that meant. So she ran out towards the field, gathering all the children with her. But when she got to where the other adults had also gathered, she realized she'd missed a baby. One of the babies was sleeping and was, uh, was kind of hidden in a sling tied to a bed. 
And she, as she narrated it to me, she said, well, you know, I decided not to go back for the baby because, um, because we weren't in fact sure if, uh, if it was safer to be outside uh, where we were in a cluster and could be seen by those planes or safer to be in a house in case they were just bombing houses to create scares. Um, and I had rushed out with the children so that if we were going to die, we all die together. Now, quite apart from the substantive detail, this is you know broadly the story she, she recounted, but quite apart from the substantive detail, you might be thinking, and imagining at this point a kind of a sober mood in the room as the family relived that trauma. But in fact, the grandmother narrated it with deep humor. She, she made jokes about how she herded these children together and there was much laughter all around. And in fact, I think I was the one laughing the least because I was trying to, head my, to wrap my head around what I just heard. Um, and, uh, and, you know, of course, it helped that the baby and the rest of the family were all safe from that particular attack, although they did lose family members from, from other attacks later on before they moved. But this brief account raises many questions about various things. Why was the baby left? Why run out to die together? Why use humor to talk about, uh, about these events? And in fact, how do I capture that humor? Do I need to capture that humor when I'm writing about this? And it's not as if there was no trauma, there was, but there were emotional and cultural resources that were being, uh, you know, being pulled in particular ways to address that trauma. There are visions of personhood, life and death, truth and justice at play that need much more explanation before I can connect the seemingly relaxed attitude towards aerial bombing with their demands for making demands for justice as well. So to unpack what justice means then, I have to unspool not only their assumptions, but also my assumptions about who is a person, what role does death play in life, how is that vision of life and death connected to visions of justice, how might they move beyond liberal conceptions uh, of legal rights, etc. So there is so much unpacking to be done before I can even get to the point of making a normative, uh, an argument about the normative weight of such a vision of justice. So at one level, the question I want to focus on today seems entirely practical, right? How to write ethnography for a political theory audience, particularly when bringing in perspectives from marginalized populations or historically marginalized traditions of thought. Uh, these are traditions of thought that political theorists have tended to not engage with. But as with most practical issues, this is pegged to philosophical stakes that I think are useful to consciously excavate. So, uh, so I think the first thing that I would say is that it is quite useful to recognize, first of all, and upfront, that writing ethnographically for a political theory audience is different from writing for, say, an anthropological or sociological audience. When methods travel across disciplines, they are inevitably modified. Anthropologists can, and indeed are expected to, show the complexity and diversity within their field sites. Um, and in fact, when they don't, there is pushback against that. And, and in the Q&A, if there's interest, we can talk about particular examples. Political theorists run into the opposite problem. There is resistance to thick description. Political theorists often find ethnographic details disorienting in terms of interrupting the flow of a structured argument and limiting in terms of binding theoretical insights to very specific contexts when the interest in theorizing is often to generalize. You know, we, we don't talk about universalizing anymore, but uh, some also hold that aspiration. And I realize, of course, that political theory is a very wide umbrella. So uh, um, Paul and Banu, in, in, in particular, have spoken about critical theory. But you know, when we say political theory, there's this whole host of ways of engaging with normative and theoretical questions. There's textual analysis, critical theory, post-colonial theory, comparative political theory, uh, history of political thought, intellectual history, linguistic analysis, moral philosophy, and of course, the commitments that we put political commitments that we bring uh, with that. And in general, 
is we have certainly seen that critical theorists are more comfortable with the use of ethnography and cross-disciplinary research. But moral and analytical philosophers, uh, and they tend to dominate the political theory conversation in United Kingdom where I'm based, moral and analytical philosophers are deeply uncomfortable with what I call the explicit use of ethnography. Uh, and this is because I think they are relying on anthropological assumptions. Some like Kant, you know, made use of ethnographic uh, research, uh, but never explicitly acknowledged it. Um, other like, others like Rawls, for instance, at one point were forced to limit the scope of what they were saying to say Western liberal uh, states, but actually never explicitly acknowledged others who were off these states, such as indigenous people, but not, you know, uh, not really, uh, not really uh, part of these uh, places. Uh, so unlike, say, bell hooks, uh, critical theorists like bell hooks, who placed herself explicitly in a particular context to make her arguments about the limitations of a particular vision of liberal feminist vision of freedom, um, we, we have uh, among most moral and, and, and uh, analytical philosophers, a lack of explicit acknowledgement of their own anthropological assumptions that they bring to their theorizing. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail uh, about that, but again, we can talk about it in the Q&A. But with this in the background, so if we are looking to talk to an audience um, that, uh, that is resistant to some of these conversations, um, uh, how do we, and even if we're not, right? Even if we are talking primarily to critical theorists, there are still challenges uh, for incorporating the, the rich detail, the many questions that have to be left answered if we are to incorporate ethnographic research into writing for a political theory audience. So here are two kind of main um, suggestions or ideas at this point. First of all, I think that uh, it's important to recognize explicitly that ethnography, I think, has to be written differently for a political theory audience. Uh, that does not mean that we give up on the promise of its richness, but that we do recognize that it will have to be used in a slightly different way. Um, the other thing I would say is that it, it is important to recognize explicitly what your ethnographic research has done for the project as a whole. So this is also about the scope of the contribution that we are planning, we are wanting to make and think about the precise role that ethnography plays in our analysis. Does it provide an insight into the questions I need to ask? Does it provide empirical evidence to support certain claims? So is it empirical evidence to support particular claims? Or does it provide an alternative vision of the world that you think we can, those of us who are not in that world, who don't live that life, can still think with, can still adapt or adopt? So I'm thinking, for instance, of Rebecca's work here uh, with Indigenous um, communities. So those of us who are not indigenous, how do we engage with those traditions of thought? Those of us who are not Muslim, how do we engage with Islamic ideas, etc. And I think this is where it does get very complicated. Um, and, and so in some ways, this is a more ambitious challenge. Um, and the additional work here for political theorists lies not just in laying out another vision of, of, of the world, which is what anthropologists can do very well, but also setting it up as a possible alternative normative framework, right? And this is where uh, really the challenge for political theorists comes in. Um, so I think relatively parsimonious approaches to ethnographic detail can still work when the purpose is to show the limits of particular conceptual um, uh, frameworks or concepts. But when you want to move beyond that, to, um, to actually think about alternatives as possible alternatives for, for those of us who are not part of that world, then I think paradoxically, and despite the resistance of moral and analytical philosophers, more lush detail is required, right? We have to make that alternative uh, normative framework uh, available and acceptable bef uh, uh, before we can present it as an alternative. 
So these are the quick thoughts with which I shall leave you. Um, uh, looking forward to the questions and answers for all of us. Perfect. Um, so I invite you, if you are a participant, to uh, raise your hand, use the chat, use the q and I'll try to follow all of those. And while you're warming up your thoughts uh, for that purpose, let me invite the panelists first um, to enjoy our appreciation. This is really um, stimulating, very well organized. Your, um, your presentations were just so well planned and um, obviously highly coordinated to make sure that we have a breadth of things to engage. Um, I'm grateful for that. And I know our audience participants are as well. So um, while they're posting their questions or raising your hands, do you have comments for each other, questions to pose to each other? Or um, Mara took a, a moment to summarize where she saw our intersections. And I wonder if others want to address uh, that possibly as well. Just a quick footnote to what um, to what you said there at the end, Humira. I mean, it can be a challenge with publishing too. I mean, I actually had an experience trying to publish my second book where the editor was really trying to push it to be just the stories and not the theory. And so that you know those categories are there in the in the publishing world. And that, I mean, it worked out because I I found a fantastic editor at a different press. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I, um, I just wanted to quickly respond to Paul on that because I think it's not just publishing books, but actually it's a bigger challenge when we're looking to publish articles because that's where especially the word limit uh, really comes into play. And so the thick detail that you think is important uh, has to be really dramatically cut out to make way for something that the political theory audience can, can easily get a handle on. Excellent. So our audience is ready to join us with press, uh, questions. Purnima? Hi, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so thank you, everybody. These were very stimulating presentations. I wanted to pick up on something that Humera was saying about what happens when tools and methods travel borders. Um, I am a anthropologist by training seeking shelter in political theory. And so I'm asking a question that is somewhat flat-footed. Um, the responses here have already been very sophisticated, but partly because this is a forum for graduate students and early career fellows who are thinking about you know, employing these methods in their own research. Um, I want to ask you a question that comes from somebody who you know, is formerly in another life, an anthropologist to say that anthropology went through its own crisis, partly because there was an important reckoning that recognized that a method was not sufficient for really engaging with the, you know, um, the politics of representation and questions of power. And so if political theorists are turning to ethnography as a way to decolonize their own discipline and practice, um, what lessons might you might one learn from the long shadow that anthropology as a discipline might cast over this particular method. Um, and, and I ask this in part because many of the communities that people might seek to work with are communities that over long periods of time have been heavily anthropologized for better or for worse, right? So even if political theorists are new to some of these kinds of ways of working and ways of theorizing, these are communities that have been represented very thickly sometimes in the kind of you know anthropological archive. You know, some of that is amazing stuff. Some of it simultaneously is very problematic. How do we kind of engage with that even as we, you know, are not seeking to be anthropologists or speaking to an anthropological audience? Who wants to take that up? Well, I wonder, should we collect questions also because we are short of time? So then, uh, I mean, that's a great question from Purnima, but I wonder if we want one or two questions together. There are some in the chat. Yeah, so uh, please feel free, panelists, to follow the Q&A and let me know if there's any you want to address. Um, and then I've just brought in Michael Goodhart, who didn't raise his question in the chat, but uh, I'll just like, we'll ask, um, 
uh, ask him to, to raise it now in response to your suggestion there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'll try to be brief. Thank you so much for a really great panel. Um, and this, this question is in no way a criticism of anything uh, that anyone said. It's just an invitation to think a little further. I was struck by the fact that all of you spoke about doing ethnographic work with collaborators with whom you are in some sense in political sympathy. And I wonder about the value potentially and also the, the difficulties and differences of doing ethnographic uh, work with collaborators with whom we might not be in political sympathy. Thanks. I mean, I'm happy to take a stab at both questions. Um, so, so to Nima's question, I, I think you're absolutely right, right? So there's a, um, uh, anthropology went through its own crisis of thinking about, uh, and, and some have argued to, uh, to taking this to, uh, the level of navel gazing, really, you know, really the, the positionality of the researcher, what you bring to the field, what you, and the problems of uh, anthropology's own history and, and imbrication with colonialism. So I think that uh, I think what you raise is really useful for political theorists to to really be cognizant of and keep in mind. No method ensures uh, ensures us uh, uh, ensures a safety from from these problems. Um, and it is, of course, this is why I think it comes together well with critical theory because there is some impetus to be critical of things as they are, uh, which allows a certain amount of, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, more self-reflective use of uh, the method. But yes, you're absolutely right. There is no guarantee. Uh, and, I, and I take your point um, uh, very clearly. Um, and others may have more to say about this. To Michael's point, I think, uh, well, you know, in my case, I did not, my first project was not with people that I was in sympathy with. My first project was with Islamist uh, parties. Uh, I was not in sympathy with them, but precisely because I was not in sympathy with them, this was an attempt at trying to understand what is, you know, the, if we move past the idea that these people are stupid or ignorant or bigoted, and we try to understand what the world looks like from their point of view, we might come to some understanding or a better understanding of the dynamics that um, have uh, unfolded in many parts of the world. So I, um, uh, I think that you're right, that it is important that we don't only think of ethnography as a method that allows us an insight into groups that we are very sympathetic with. I'll stop and maybe the other panelists have others. Afama, do you want to jump in there? Sure, thank you, Brooke. Um, I, I don't know if I have anything profound to say, but I wanted to uh, try to collect a few thoughts, to gather my own thoughts about the crisis of anthropology and, um, and also the political sympathy question. I think the crisis of anthropology, but also other disciplines in general that rely heavily on particular methods, so much so that they become identified with that method, shows us the dangers of a kind of methodological fetishism. So while, you know, today we've been talking about ethnography in a sustained manner, but I think what this panel uh, aims to do is to broaden what political theory is and how it's done in general. And this could also be done through other methods. I think, in fact, a kind of suppleness and willingness to experiment with different methods is precisely the point, that when the method refies into the only way to do something, to learn about something, that's when it creates more problems than it resolves or brings more disadvantages and shortcomings. So I think anthropology has tried to creatively and very critically address these things. There are ways, in my opinion, are maybe not as productive for political theory. For example, I'm thinking of like autoethnography as a solution to the problems of ethnography. And I think I, I, this would not be my preferred strategy to resolve these issues, but I think maybe prioritizing the questions that we are trying to answer 
and and being eclectic in the methods according to those questions, like following the lead of those questions, might be useful uh, to address some of the problems that other um, fellow disciplines and and travelers are are experiencing. And just a, a quick note on the uh, political sympathies question. I think it's really good ethnography. Um, the danger of a kind of ethnographic approach could be a, a, a partisanship or, or you know, a speaking for. And I think this is a temptation that can best be um, uh, guarded against when the political uh, uh, theory person, the researcher in question, um, is in fact ambivalent or undecided or uh, uh, has different opinions than what um, uh, they are researching. And I think that's that kind of encounter in the field that challenges one's own assumptions can be really transformative and generative. So I think that's a, a really important point about what to study as, as much as how to study it. So thank you for that question. Thank you. I'm going to go next to Sagmit and uh, then uh, to Rebecca. Yeah, hi, thank you for that question. Uh, and I'm indeed very aware of the risks of lapsing into a kind of Occidentalism. And I think similar points were also raised in the question about anthropology's own history with in relation to these communities that have been heavily anthropologized. So, and that is precisely why in my research, I am not interested in recovering, recovering some pristine notion of religion or of community. And I'm and I explicitly guard against that because the social movements that I engage and the minority religious groups that I uh, interacted with were very interested in questions of liberal citizenship. So, uh, and they were, they had their own complicated ways of conceptualizing it and uh, thinking about their relationship with it. So I kind of escaped that kind of um, the, the uh, tendency to fetishize and kind of occidentalize these communities by paying attention to, again, the hybridity of their conceptual categories and of the kind of worlds that they inhabit. So again, and these worlds are heavily mediated by um, discourses of uh, rights and liberalism and, and so on. But having said that, I do not also want to reduce their uh, life worlds merely to standard debates in analytical philosophy, because that, I think, reduces the richness of um, the conceptual architecture of some of these movements and these categories. So you know, paying attention to the hybridity, to questions of kind of interaction between uh, different worlds without reducing them to one or the other, either kind of making this out to be a story of cultural difference and pristine communities and religion, which is not very helpful in a modernizing world, and also kind of escaping the other extreme of, I think, thinking about this, just reducing the experiences of communities to standard debates in liberal political philosophy. So I'm kind of trying to, I have tried to escape both these kind of extremes of um, uh, approaches and engagements, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, two, maybe three indulgences. One is to our panelists and audience to allow us to go a little bit longer. As those who are my students know, um, I end class exactly on time, even if I'm in the middle of my own sentence, how the alarm goes off, that's the end. However, um, I have come to appreciate that that is one of the ways in which I have internalized my whiteness and settler colonialism with my obsession with time and not wasting anybody's time. So uh, since the panelists have all nodded, the rest of you feel free to drop off. Nobody will be offended. The recording will be available online, particularly if you sign up with us so we can make sure we notify you of that fact. Rebecca, I wonder if I could ask you to address one of the questions from the Q&A, which is how far would you say that ethnographic research is fundamental to issues within public policy? Do you feel comfortable addressing that one? I see Paul nodding. So I wonder if you would want to address that, you should as well, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I will. One more, one more thing. And if the rest of you wouldn't mind um, noting Monique's question, 
and uh, we'll go around at the very end and say, how did you learn how to do this? When did you learn how to do this? Obviously, we're all working on how to do this well, but but how did how did you tool up in a concrete way? So yes, Rebecca first, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, with respect to that question, I think you know this comes back to talking about uh, ethnography and um, uh, and methodologies. Um, and um, I really appreciated uh, Banu's points earlier. I, you know, I, I always refer to myself. I always say I'm not a methodological purist. Um, because if you're engaged in this kind of work, you have to be working with the group that uh, you're working with in ways that, you know, they want to talk about it and think about it and also engage um, methodologically in it. So um, I actually um, very seldomly refer to my research as ethnographic, um, but insofar as I describe my work as um, as it's an exploration of phenomenon from the standpoint of the actors involved in it, and it involves a deep engagement and proximity with those populations, my work is absolutely ethnographic, but this is a very academic term for a lot of the communities I work with, and anthropology would be a pretty uncomfortable term for um, any indigenous community um, that I've, I've worked with, I can tell you. Um, so it's not, it, it, I, you know, I, I tend to draw on and use language from distinct methodologies that are um, aligned with the kinds of ethnographic approaches we're speaking about, because again, within ethnography, there's such a huge diversity. Um, so I'll tend to draw from decolonizing participatory languages. I also draw from phenomenology, though that's not something I use as much, you know, um, in discussions with communities. So I think this is important to say that that principle, that principle of um, working closely to understand um, different actors' experience um, of, a, of, of their lives, of a given issue, um, as a principle of social policy, yes, I completely do think this is a really important um, approach, whether you call it ethnography or whether you draw on other methodologies, as, as, as long as they're methodologically sound and accountable to the communities you're with, I think um, can differ. Um, and there was one other point I was going to make, um, but I will, I'll, I'll, I'll pass now because I, I think there's other things we want to get on to. You can circle back to it when you do your answer to the, um, to the, how you got your method question and then it might pop by then. Uh, I didn't plan how to start, but Paul, we haven't heard from you a bit, so let's start with you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to, um, yeah, to, to, to respond. First of all, I just think, um, what you said, Banu, about about you know being experimental in methods and not having a fetishism for any particular method—that's you know I absolutely agree that that's what we should be encouraging in political theory. One way to do that is to uh, you know engage political theory as a potential source of methodological innovation. So I mean I found it helpful to to think about Gramsci and his his theorizing of common sense and the relationship between uh, intellectuals and organic intellectuals and popular common sense as a way to craft an interpretive method uh, for one of my projects. And that's how I, I mean, Paulo Freire is not a canonical figure as we know in political theory, but I think that's, um, you know, that's, that, that's another uh, source of ideas about how to craft uh, methods. You know, I didn't, I, I actually didn't say that, I, I made a point of not saying that I was doing ethnography until a few months ago. But like last year during the strikes in the UK, I was hanging out with my anthropology colleagues um, at the pub and they convinced me that it was fine for me to say I was doing ethnography because it had become so, uh, so much more uh, rich and diverse. So if you're out there, uh, Yazan and others, thank you for that. <laughs> but um, uh, but you, you know, I just, I, I think that there, there's like we can, we can gain new insights into the ideas in critical theory or political theory that we want to develop through our field interactions, but we can also work on, you know, it's, it's a, a, the meta question of, 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 of how to practice um, engagement with uh, non-academic communities by using the resources of political theory uh, when, they, when, when they help. And just uh, quickly to Michael's question. So my first project, the Adorno project was actually also on the Christian right. And I tried a little something like ethnography at the end of it. And my sense is that one can be a, an observer, um, and, but not much more. Uh, like I, I, I found that I couldn't really interact with um, the people when I went to a couple of events. 
uh, held by the organization Focus on the Family. Also, I was picked out. I thought I was being very inconspicuous, taking notes just like anybody else. But the organizer picked me out and, and basically scolded me for, he said, you know, I know what you're up to. I know what you're doing here. And so uh, not only was I inconspicuous, but it was not inconspicuous, but it was bad. Um, Monique, that's, I, that's, that's what I would say in answer to your question, too. I mean, I, I learned the methods by getting uh, informal help from anthropology colleagues, but not in graduate school, and, um, and through engaging with uh, critical theory texts that write about these issues. Somebody want to jump in or should I call them? Maybe I can go. Yeah, sure. So uh, about ethnography and how I learned these research methods. So in my graduate school, kind of uh, in my postgraduate studies and during my doctoral studies, uh, I did interact with quite a lot of research communities who were conducting similar research. And um, but I was also drawn to kind of um, different worlds, really, in my graduate school. So there was a lot of there were a lot of people doing very history of political thought and intellectual history kind of research. And I felt like the questions that I was asking did intersect with that world as well. So I think the conversations with the, histori with the historians of political thought and intellectual historians has been productive in terms of kind of um, drawing me to the larger picture of uh, and the historical context of some of the questions that I was asking. And other than that, in another life, I used to be a magazine journalist. So I think that is something that also really drew me to kind of interviewing and other methods that involve working and interacting closely with uh, communities. So that. Uh, Banu, do you want to give a closing uh, remark on your methodologies and how uh -huh. you Tell you how you experiment with whom you experiment. I mean, I think obviously courses and a kind of academic preparation is necessary, but it in no way completely prepares you for the field. I think a lot of this is learning by doing and making mistakes. I think you know, like I I remember regretting many um, encounters that could that could have gone differently or or false leads or not sufficient note taking or over note taking. I mean, there, there, there's so many um, things that I think are practical and, and are based on a kind of experiential knowledge that gets better over time. And, and, um, and the other thing I think is having interlocutors who are like-minded, who have similar sensibilities. I think there's so much resistance within the discipline of political theory to let's say heterodox approaches that um, it's it's hard, especially as a as a junior scholar, it's hard not to be broken down by that. It's hard to insist that what you're doing is political theory still and should be acknowledged as such. So having your own community uh, of people who are doing similar things, I think is really, really important, um, both because it enriches you, but also it uh, gives you solidarity and support when you most need it. Thank you. Shall we go to Rebecca and then Humaira, and then I'll close us out? Sure, thanks, Brooke. Um, yeah, I, so I learned very much uh, my methodologies and methods in the field, but not just by doing, um, there's really very rigorous, um, excellent training and programs and organizations out there who do this very well. It's very research-based. Um, so I, I had the support of a lot of colleagues and uh, trainings and support to do that. And then I gained a lot of um, firsthand experience, like uh, Banu says, which is critical for that iterative learning process. Um, when I came back to uh, to do my PhD, finally, I did actually decide one of the reasons I wanted to do that was to formalize my academic training in that. So I was trying to figure out what department to go to. Um, and my home department, although I, I did a program in cultural, social, political theory, my home department I chose was sociology specifically because um, there was a lot of methodological training in that program. Um, and it was interesting for me to see um, how little applied um, 
training there actually was available in that program. And I saw a lot of my cohort and colleagues going through that training without that lived experience. And there was there was definitely a gap there. Um, and I just wanted to make a final point about that point about difference, that question, which is so helpful. Um, because yes, let's, you know, there, there's a lot of cases of this kind of research being very solidaristic, but I think it really is delving into those points of difference, um, provided there you, you're still within the same page um, of interest in a topic, um, is actually really where there's very fruitful um, work to be had. And I think that's where, you know, the, the theories, the, the point isn't to reach a conclusive theory, but to continue to engage in dialogue in different ways. So actually my postdoctoral research is actually based entirely on significant points of difference between the youth climate activists and the human rights actors. Um, and that's very interesting for me. And I hadn't intended to head down that pathway, but the conversation is not over because of these differences. So I thank you for that question. Um, thank you. So I guess, you know, uh, to, to Monique's question about how um, the training that we that I received, I feel that uh, I, I came to ethnographic research uh, primarily out of dissatisfaction with the, both the training that I had received and also um, the conversation that I saw in my in the university that I was doing my PhD in, the uh, the emphasis was very much on history of political thought, um, and uh, and in many ways it seemed really divorced from the kinds of conversations that were being had in the context that I grew up in in Pakistan, the debates that we were having with within the wider kind of South Asia context, and it just seemed like those conversations were not directed towards were not speaking to those contexts at all. So it felt like there had to be something else that one could do to bring those other worlds into this conversation. And in fact, I thought a lot about why we should even bring these worlds into conversation, right? So what is the premium on political theory? Uh, why not you know, stay in a different discipline and have those conversations elsewhere? And that may be a, a, a longer conversation to be uh, to to have about why political theory, but there is a there is certain amount of influence that political theory carries in all of social sciences in providing the normative architecture, the conceptual repertoires that um, you know social sciences more generally work with. And it seems that especially if you are working on contexts that are non-Western beyond the Euro-American context you are relegated to area studies and uh you know, area studies have had really exciting, very rich research, but that research does not seem to speak to uh, the context, uh, Euro-American context, when in fact, you know, everything that we know from histories of uh, uh, global capitalism uh, will tell us that these uh, parts of the world have been connected in, in many ways, in many intimate ways. Uh, the flow of ideas uh, has not necessarily been only one way, etc. Uh, so it felt it was essentially a response to, I guess, um, uh, a lack that was very apparent in my training that I started looking for um, other ways of complementing or answering the questions that I that seemed more important. Thank you. This has been great. It's at this moment that I wish there was a button that would let me elevate everybody at once so we could all I'll, I'll share in the fact that we've had this rich audience this whole time. I want to thank you and remind you that this came about because of Kumara's initiative. And I see, oh, look, Michael's using the chat to share his thoughts. Thanks, everybody, for stepping into the chat. This came about because of Kumara's initiative. Um, and I hear a few conversation themes that are unfinished from us. So doing this work with um, people with whom we are not politically aligned. Um, I think there are methodological questions that have been raised and some of them take a particular, take a different answer if, um, if those are the kinds of in, engagements we're, engage, we're, we're trying to be involved in. Um, I loved Bonnie's reference to making mistakes and then hers were so small. I mean, I've made those too, I'm taking too many notes, not enough notes, uh, all my you know redundancies and, and yet still something didn't get captured. 
but I've made much bigger ones than you. <laughs> so I think learning from mistakes, um, there's probably a whole session we could do on that. And likewise, um, how we answer Monique's question, how we train ourselves, and then as Mira said, and then do that in political theory to contribute to conversations in political theory that then can speak outside of political theory. Um, I'm sure others have ideas about uh, conversations they'd like to see happen. Um, please reach out to us about that. I'd be happy to help you facilitate leading this. Um, and I really am just so grateful for this really stimulating conversation and for all of the uh, contributors in the Q&A that prompted to come to such um, great fruition at the end. Thank you, everybody.